All right, folks, tonight we're going to get started on chapter six, which is all about databases. So let's just start off with a little bit of terminology. Some of this we may have heard of before, some of it may be new, and that's okay. So what is a, a database? Um, and the way our book defines it is a group of related files. Databases come in all flavors, all shapes, and all sizes. And for all intents and purposes, um, an Excel file will very much work as a database. Um, there are some programs that write their files for the database in a flat file, which can be opened in like Notepad or something like that in a computer. Uh, or in a um, in just a notepad uh, txt file. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be some advanced file system um, that that's handling the storage of the, the the data. So when the book calls it a group of related files, it really can be just one document. It can be an Excel document. It can be a txt file, wherever that uh, however that application, the database management system is storing that data. And then what's the file? It's a group of records. Um, and it's saying here, the book is saying that it's the, a group of records of the same type. Well, what does that mean? It's usually the same, it's usually a text type of data or it's image data. Um, they could be sound clips of data. It, they're stored in a particular file of all the same type of, type of data. Um, those particular records are a group of related fields. So a record could be, you know, accounting data where it might have charges, payments, adjustments, things like that. It could be student courses, um, the name of a course, the location of the course, how many students are in the course, the faculty member assigned to the course, something like that. So a record will be a group of uh, related fields. What is a field? A field is a group of characters, words, numbers, something like that, some, some descriptive text, for instance. Um, it's typically made up of some entity, which can be a person, place, or thing, anything that we're trying to store information on. And each of the entities has some attribute. Uh, it's a characteristic, a quality, or a describing entity. And those attributes can be that that particular text field or that particular field may only store text. It may only store numbers. It may only store decimals. It may only store date time stamps things like that. So each, each field uh, typically has an attribute where it will only store one particular type of, of, um, of data point. And there's usually a lot of rules associated on the database where those cannot be broken. There's types of databases that can store multiple different um, types of data or uh, records in, uh, not records, uh, fields, it, I guess, entries, entities. In, in one particular field. It's, it's a little more rare to come across one of those databases. They're, I guess, a little older is a better way to describe it. Um, it's not a, a contemporarily used database, but they certainly exist and you could come across one in your travels for sure. Just a quick example, um, a graphical example that the book uses of how data is built or how data may live in your system. Starting at the very bottom, a bit, a zero or one, then it's turned into a byte, um, which is a grouping of eight bits, um, which is turned into a single letter or a number. Um, those single letters or numbers are grouped into a field, which in this case is a course, a course identifier. Then we pull together numerous pieces, numerous fields into a record. So we have a student ID, a course, a date, and a grade. Um, all of those are pulled together in what might be a course file, um, which has all that information pulled together uh, for multiple students. And at the top level, we have a database which has a course file, a personnel file, finance file, which would each have data relating to those specific, um, fee, uh, those specific entities or, or realms, however you want to describe them. Some problems with traditional file storage file environments. Um, the files are maintained, this is, this is not a view necessarily of the contemporary computing world. This is um, before our more modern data storage, database storage. Um, files were maintained separately by different departments. So the accounting system had one, um, one record management system. 
uh, HR had another, accounts payable may have had a different one. So, um, the manufacturing may have had a different one. Each different department within the company typically had their own computer system, their own way of handling and storing data, and they didn't really talk to each other. There was a lot of redundancy, and because of a lot of that redundancy, the data redundancy, there was a lot of inconsistency. You may have spelled a supplier's name incorrectly across the different databases based on how somebody data entered it. Accounts payable may have entered um, Dell, D-E-L-L, -L, all lowercase, but then in the purchasing department, they have, may have spelled it all uppercase. Well, depending on a data, uh, type of database system, those could be two completely different um, entities. They, they're not necessarily the same. There are some entities that are case sensitive. You know, a third system in the HR system or accounts payable, they might have spelled it Dell with a capital D and everything else, lowercase. So there could be a lot of problems depending on um, a computer system based on how that data is stored. Then there's a program data dependency. So some programs can only read the data in their particular database or the way it's stored or um, how it is retrieved uh, or the application isn't built to be able to talk to other database systems and can only read the data underlying its particular programming. There's often a lack of flexibility. It's difficult to add new fields to um, those older traditional kind of databases. Uh, you have to rewrite the database and then the application sitting on top of it if you wanted to do any changes to the entire system. Typically poor security associated with them as well. And lack of interoperability. So the HR system and the accounts payable or the employee um, uh, you know, uh, system in ordering may not be able to talk to each other and more than likely were not able to talk to each other. They were all completely siloed and separate systems. Just a quick example of it, you know, accounting, finance, HR, sales, marketing, manufacturing, all lived basically in their own entire silos without the ability to talk to each other else. They all had their own applications, their own users, and all the files associated with each of their own silos, completely separate, never talked to each other. That shifts a little bit when we start looking at database management systems. So the database, um, this can serve many applications, and it does so because it centralizes the data and it helps us to remove some of that redundant data. So to a point, those three different ways that I described to spell Dell shouldn't necessarily matter anymore. Now, again, it depends on the type of database that you use. You could still have an all uppercase Dell and all lowercase Dell and a Dell with a capital D as three different entities, three different records within the database. That is still possible. Um, but in a database management system with a more contemporary um, database management application on top of it, it is less likely or it's easier to fix. It's easier to identify. So a database management system or DBMS, this application is the interface between um, the application that a user might use. So an HRIS system, human resource information system, a, um, an ordering system, you know, a finance system, and wherever the physical data files live. This is the intermediary, it's the middleware. It lives between the two of them and it helps the, you know, that, that end user software, the HRIS for instance, interact with the database, the data files. It serves as the go-between between them. It separates the logical and physical views of the data. So it separates uh, how the views are presented in the computer, how the data is presented in the computer. And it also works with the operating system to dictate how the data will be stored on the disk. And it solves some, some problems of a traditional file environment. And as I said, it helps to control that redundancy. It helps to eliminate some of the inconsistency with maybe how things are spelled or stored. And what it does that's really important is it does the, some of the uncoupling between the programs and the data. We can now add fields to the database that we may not have been able to add before because it was so tightly coupled with the application. If we wanna add new fields to the database, new tables to the database, we can do that without destroying the application that sits on top of it. 
And it enables the, the organization to essentially manage some of the data and the security. So instead of each department having their own entire system that was siloed and, and away from everything else, we can manage that with one system, one team, you know, the IT team can do it. We can also apply the same security rules and governance to all of the systems consistently, hopefully. Questions or thoughts around this far working with databases? Could you maybe give us an example of uh, what happens when uncoupling programs and data doesn't work, like how it used to mess it up? Sure. Um, so if the application itself was tightly coupled with the database, uh, say it was just a finance system, um, an older legacy finance system, and you wanted to say all account numbers in the finance system were three, um, three numbers long for every, every, you, every company that you had in there at, to, to, for the accounts payable system was, was three numbers long. And you're such a big company, you've grown, you've used all your numbers from 000 to 999. And now you need to go and say, oh, we have another supplier to add here. What are we gonna do? Because of that tight coupling, it might be impossible to change the numbers from three numbers long to four numbers long. And you might actually have to rewrite the entire application, uh, take it offline, rewrite the entire application and the database to be able to handle four numbers long. When it becomes uncoupled, you may be able to just make a change to the database and the application itself might not have to be touched at all and automatically read the four numbers and not be a problem. Hope that helps. Here's just a, a quick, simple database view. Um, on the left side, a human resources database with just some, some attributes about um, in the in the human resource file that might be that we might keep an employee ID and, and some attributes there. There's a database management system that is reaching out and um, and it is slicing this data up into something we call a view. So we may have certain users that are working in maybe the benefits department, and we don't want those users to see all of the data that's in the human resource database. We could use something called a view where we create small tables um, with only certain pieces from the master table, the human resource database, with just the information those benefits users need to see to get their job done. In this case, it might be name, social security, and maybe what healthcare they have. We don't want them to see how much people make. But then we can also take that same human resource database information and create a second view uh, the payroll view, where the folks working in payroll don't need to see what healthcare people have. So we can give them name, social security number, their gross and their net pay, and be able to apply a little bit of security and job separation uh, for those two different roles uh, through something called a view. And this is a pretty common way. Um, and this is this, the, the concept of views and the, the, this concept of slicing the data up to just show people the data in the database that they need to get their job done. This is a pretty common practice and this really is used uh, just about everywhere. So that brings us into what we just saw, which was this view and going forward, which is the relational database management system or just relational databases is really all you have to call it. Um, I don't know a lot of folks in the in the wild that are going to say, "Oh, this is our DBMS. It's just, this is our database," and <laughs> that's about all they're going to call it. Um, so, in each of these um, relational database uh, systems, you're going to have data represented as two-dimensional tables. What in the world does that mean? A two-dimensional table typically has a column and uh, a row. Think of this as Excel. You're gonna have columns that go across that may have attributes that you're looking for. Employee ID, first name, last name, address, phone number, things like that. And then you're gonna have rows down the side, which are each of the records in the database. And that's the two dimensions that we're gonna see. Each of the tables in the database is gonna collect data on the entity, which might be around 
uh, human resource or the person, what have you, and the, the specific attributes, which are the columns. Inside of that table is the grid. Again, think Excel, think Excel, think Excel. You're gonna have down the left side, you're gonna have rows. The rows are gonna be the records for each of the different entities. If this is a human resources table, it's gonna have records for each of our employees. In parentheses, you'll see the word tuples. If someone calls a record in a database a tuple, they are old. Uh, we probably haven't used the word tuples in a long, long time. So when someone says, oh, take a look at these tuples, I know you've been doing it longer than I've been alive. And that's fine, that's great, I'm happy you're here. Um, I just know when you say that word, you are a legacy employee. And I shouldn't use that word. You've been around a long time, you're experienced. But typically they're called rows. The fields, which are the columns, if we're thinking Excel, that's A, B, C, D, E, F, G across the top. These represent the attributes. So the employee ID, the first name, the last name, their position, their title, things like that. Um, these are the fields that we're trying to capture the information about those specific employees. These two next things, the primary and foreign keys, these are fields within the table that help us to organize the tables, to help them be faster, um, help us to index the tables, and help us to link these tables to other tables. So the first one here, the primary key, <laughs> this is used as kind of like the main the main indexer of the the table um, it's typically a number so for every record you might have an employee id 001 002 003 and so on and there can be other primary keys as well the primary key is unique in the database and that means it never is duplicated there are no 2001 employee ids Two employees cannot have that same ID if that's the primary key. It's not possible. You have a primary key error um, and you can't create the second record. There's only ever one unique primary ID. The next one down, a foreign key. This is used um, in another table as a lookup field back to the first table. This is basically um, an index or a marker that can link two tables together. It will reach back to the other table and say, oh, this is the record that you want in that other table. And uh, they're both ap almost absolutely required to have in, um, in, in, in any table. You can have multiple foreign and multiple primary keys in any table, and that's perfectly legal. Questions on these? Because here's what they look like. So if we look at the top one, our supplier table, we have the columns, which are our, um, our attributes, supplier number, supplier name, supplier street, city, state, zip. These are all of our attributes or our fields. Typically, they're just called fields. If we look le left to right, those would be numbered one, two, three, four, five, if we're looking at Excel. And those are our rows or our records. Or if you've been around for a while, tuples. If we look to the left of the green table at the top, we see our primary keys. And these are unique supplier numbers. 8259, 8261, 8263, 8444. These are unique to those supplier names and they cannot be duplicated. Once the table hits uh, thousands and thousands of rows, the database will also use those as an indexing system to help make file um, and, and record retrieval faster. If we look down at the second table, which is a part number table, we'll see the same thing. We have fields going across the top, part number, name, unit price, supplier. And we have those same rows or records, um, 137, 145, 150, 152, 155, 178. We also have the primary key in this table, which is our part number again. But you'll see all the way to the right, we have a foreign key, which is that supplier number. If we wanted to link the part number and the supplier together, we would link them together on that foreign key in the database. 
So we can query from the supplier table to the part number table, or if we had to say which supplier uh, produces part number 137, well, we can link back from 8259 to our supplier table, linking on the supplier number and say, well, part number 137 is produced by supplier CBM Incorporated. So hopefully you can see how those link together. Obviously it's nice and clean when we have just two tables and when you have 2000 tables, it gets a little more gross. You can have multiple foreign keys. You typically don't have multiple foreign keys that would link two tables together, but it can happen. Um, it's not a problem if it does. You may have a table that has multiple foreign keys to help it reach out to lots of other tables though. Uh, and that's how you'll end up uh, build, doing all of your, your um, your, your joints to, to get the records that you're looking for. So how do we get data out of these databases? The operations that we're typically gonna use, the first one is select. We're gonna say select and tell it what data that we want. We might say select star, give me all the data. Or we might say select supplier name or select part name if I wanted to. And then we would say from and tell it what table that we want. When we want to link two tables together, we'll use join. And then we'll, then we'll give it some information on how to join tables together. This last one is project or project. And stop writing. The book is gonna tell you about project or project. So I put it in here. Never in my life have I seen it used. And I'm not gonna ask you about it. It will not be on the test. But the book talks about it and no, there's nothing more that I like to do than argue with a textbook. Never seen it used in my whole life. If we wanted to create a view, we would use a command called create view, and then we would use a select star from where and use join and, and do it that way. It, never in my life have I seen project, but maybe it maybe somebody does, not me. If you're taking my database class over the summer, you will become very familiar with select join and you will never see project because it's not a thing. I'm not trying to sell that class over the summer, I'm just telling you it's an option. If we wanted to link these tables together, again, you can see that we're gonna link all three of these tables. We might do a, um, the part in the supplier, we would link them together on the supplier number, as I mentioned, and spit out the query below, which had the part number, part name, supplier number, supplier name, linking them all together on that supplier number. And I, in another two slides, I have an example of, of, uh, of a SQL query, and we'll talk about SQL in just a moment. Okay, so far. Has anybody had a chance to work with some databases or SQL? No? All right. So let's talk about some of the capabilities. There's a data definition capability, which is the ability to say what data will live in what fields and that field will not be able to accept any data other than the data that you've said will live in the field. It's kind of like a validation. The next one is a data dictionary. The data dictionary tells us everything about uh, the database in terms of the tables, what lives in the tables, the fields in the tables, what the primary, the foreign key, the attributes of the fields are, meaning if it's a number, how many decimals it can take, or if it's an integer, um, if it's a string, if it's a char, what, whatever, um, everything about those particular uh, tables is. It can often tell us um, where it comes from as well, and it tells us what table all of the fields live in. When we're getting data out of the table, 
we use something that's a data manipulation language or a data querying language. The most common one that's used is called SQL, SQL or Structured Query Language. It's spelled SQL, not S-E-Q-U-E-L. That's for a movie. SQL or SQL is the database language. A lot of them, a lot of database management systems have some ability for you to do um, reporting built into them. Uh, one that a lot of us may be familiar with is just using Microsoft's Access. Access is a very visual way of building SQL queries. Um, it can help build them in a visual GUI graphical user interface method without having to write any actual syntax and has reporting capabilities that will spit out what you need it to do without having to know any SQL syntax. Just a quick actual snippet of some, some language here, uh, some bit of SQL syntax. Select the part number, uh, the part name, the supplier number, supplier name from the part table, the supplier, ta uh, supplier table, where the part number and uh, equals the supplier number. Um, and the part number is 137 or the part number is 150. This will return back the part number, the part name, the supplier number, the supplier name, um, wherever that part number is 137 or 150. And that would reach back to here. And you'll see that it's giving us a query of part number 137 or 150. Um, and all of the supplier names and the supplier number and the supplier name, uh, this query is this result down in the orange. This is also a super complicated way to do it. You don't need to type in part or supplier in front of some of that syntax. Um, this is very wordy, but it does the thing. So designing databases. How often will a lot of us have to deal with it? Well, probably not very often. There are some very specialized, talented folks that will build databases for us. Um, we end up often just having to deal with data coming out from the back end. Um, but you may end up having to design tables, for instance, and maybe you'll get to work on building a database from the ground up. That's very possible. So there's a conceptual design versus the physical design. And you know the conceptual design is, OK, we need to have it what kind of data are we storing? Um, how might we lay out the data in terms of tables? Um, you know, what type of rules, uh, what type of database rules are we trying to have in place? Um, security, who's gonna have access to it? Those kinds of things. And then we get down into the physical design where somebody is actually going into SQL, perhaps SQL Server Management Studio. Um, and actually creating the tables and setting everything up and applying the attributes. Moving down, we get to something called normalization. Normalization is really just the process of reducing, uh, um, removing redundancies. So we'll see a slide in just a moment where there's a lot of redundant data stored across the table, um, across one particular row. And that's really inefficient. You know, every time I put a student into a database or into a class, I'd have to type their name over and over and over again. Well, that's really, um, really redundant, really prone to user error. There are other ways of doing it. Um, and we would create a student table, we would create a class table, and then we would join them together as we needed. And we'd only ever have to enter student names perhaps one time. Um, and uh, normalization is the process of kind of removing some of that redundancy. Then there's referential integrity. And these are, uh, these are rules used by the relational database management system to ensure that relationships between the tables remain consistent. Well, what the heck does that mean? Say we had a, a classes table and we had a students table and we had students that were enrolled in a particular class. A referential integrity uh, rule might tell us that we were not, we would not be able to delete a class while students were enrolled in it. So if I went to the table for courses and tried to delete it, 
but there were students enrolled in it, we would get a referential integrity error saying, nope, you can't do that. There are people tied to this course. So these are kind of like the business rules uh, or the way the database tables are tied together that would tell us what we can and can't do based on whatever rules that we set up. The next thing down is an entity relationship diagram. This is also just called an ERD. The entity relationship diagram is uh, often a graphical representation. So it looks a lot like this of all of the tables in the database with error, arrows pointing at each of the tables and from each of the tables showing you how they link together. So it may look a little bit something like this, showing me how to link all the tables together when I'm going to build a query. In case I don't know how they link together uh, or I'm looking for something that I've never had to link before, I may refer, uh, refer to an ERD to learn how to link all these together. And it goes without saying, having the correct model, having a data dictionary, having an ERD, it's just essential for being able to get data back out of the databases. Also for troubleshooting, really, really important. Here is just a row of data before normalization. So we have order numbers, dates, part numbers, supplier information, um, all kind of in one row. Every time we created an order, we'd have to put the supplier name in here. We'd have to put uh, the part name in here. We'd have to put in a, a state, a zip, a city. If you can imagine all of this as thousands and thousands of rows containing the same information, it would get really, really redundant. What if you type PA, all uppercase, PA, lowercase, capital P, lowercase A, capital, or lowercase P, capital A, Depending on the type of database, it can see those all as four different types of states. When we move into a normalized table, we actually try to take out that redundancy or take out all of that duplication um, and make things a little bit easier. So we're going to move the part information to one specific table and create a key. Supplier moves to a supplier table and we create a key. We may move orders to an order table and have a key. And then each time we need to refer to that, instead of referring to the part number, name, price, and supplier, we're going to just refer to the key number or the, um, the um, primary key for that particular row instead of all that data. It really can help reduce the size of the database because we don't have to store all that duplicate data. And it can help us with. Um, having less chance of a database um, data entry redundancy error because we only ever typed in the unit price we only had typed in the supplier number the part name and the part number one time and that was it you know what if the supplier comes back and says oh well it's no longer ten dollars for this part it's fifteen dollars can you imagine if you had thousands and thousands of rows in that database, you'd have to update that unit price thousands and thousands and thousands of times. If you have it just in a part table and it's only listed one time and referred elsewhere by a primary or foreign key, you only have to change the unit price one time and all of those fields um, would be updated with that one change. And that's how we build more contemporary normalized relational database tables in the method that's here. Non-normalized, normalized. This is just a very, very simple ERD, entity relationship diagram. There's a supplier, a part, a line item, and an order. And the lines tell us how they're linked together. These lines though, they're all a little bit different. And they're indicating some relationships here called one to many. If we look at the relationship between supplier and part on the left side, the line between supplier and part is indicating a one to many relationship. 
one supplier has many parts. On the left side of the line, we have a single line with two parallel lines. That's telling us one. One line item in the supplier, and it's reaching over to the part table with a single parallel line and like a little trident. That's telling us many. So one supplier has many line items in the part table. When we look to the right, there's an order that has multiple line items in the line item table. There's an order which has a one relationship to the line item table, which has a many. So one order has many line items. And let's think about that. An order typically has lots of things in it. Can a line item have multiple parts? No, you only ever put one thing on a line. But can a part be listed multiple times in a line item or a receipt? Let's put it a different way. We're going to Wendy's. We're going to get some nugs. We're going to get some fries. And we're going to get a junior bacon cheeseburger. Our supplier is Wendy's. And we only have one. But we're going to get three things, right? Our one Wendy's trip is going to get us some nugs, some fries, and a JBC. We have a one-to-many relationship. Got it? All the way over on the right side, we have one order, which has three line items, our nugs, our fries, a JBC. We're going to get our receipt. Our receipt is the line item. We're going to have I'm sorry, our receipt is gonna be the parts list. And it's gonna have, we're gonna have one receipt and it's gonna have multiple line items in it. One line item for each of our, our items that we've ordered. So this whole thing is just a trip to Wendy's. One supplier with many things that we purchased, one order with many things that we purchased, and then we have our one receipt that lists all of our line items that we purchased from the store. If it's got two parallel lines, it's a one relationship. If it's got one single line and a little trident, it's a many. You can have a one to one relationship. You can have one supplier has one part. Maybe they only produce one thing. You can have one order where an order only contains one line item. Maybe you went to the store and you only got the spicy nugs. And that's okay too. It doesn't always have to be a one-to-many. It could also be a many-to-many -many relationship where you can have many suppliers have many parts. That's perfectly legal as well. So just pay attention to the lines and how many are on there. And if it has a trident or not. The trident side means many, the two parallel lines means one. All right, there are other types of databases that are not relational, like the ones that we've just talked about. And these are just called non-relational databases, often called NoSQL. They're a little more flexible in their data model. They're not so rigid. They don't always have to live on one machine. You could have data sets stored across multiple computers, multiple servers multiple storage environments. Because they live across multiple machines and they're designed to live across multiple computers, they're easier to scale. You can add additional computers to the uh, additional nodes to the system. And they're designed to handle larger volumes of unstructured and structured data. Structured data are the things that we might have when we fill out a form and it's a drop down, or it's a calendar and we pick the date on the calendar uh, or we click the check boxes for yes, no or a check box or a no check box. That is all structured data. We only have certain things from which we can choose. 
an un unstructured data might be a comment box where we just put things in comments. Unstructured data are also all of our posts on the Twitter grams, our captions on the Instawebs, the Instagrams, and the Facebook posts. Those are all unstructured datas. Your Instagram selfies, those are all also unstructured data points. Sound clips, unstructured data. Tweets, unstructured data. Facebook posts, unstructured data. Checkbox on a form, structured data. Date element on a form, structured data. If you really limit the option of what somebody is gonna to put to a drop-down checkbox calendar, for instance, structured data. Comment boxes, photos, sound clips, um, things like that, posts, Twitter feed, things like that, unstructured data. And of course, we also have databases in clouds. Those appeal to the startups, so they have low cost, low barriers to entry, um, smaller businesses as well, maybe interested in them. Um, and this is, for instance, Amazon's RDS service, which is the relational database service. And also there's Microsoft SQL Azure. And then companies have their own private clouds as well. We've talked before about big data. We know it's a massive amount of unstructured or semi-structured or even structured data from, could be the web traffic, social media, sensors, uh, our own company data, depending on its size. Um, it could be uh, transaction data from sales and things like that. <clears throat> it's just massive amounts of data. Typically, the amount of data, the volume is too big for something like SQL to handle. It's typically just too much. It's also typically coming in too fast for SQL to handle. It's SQL usually has to freeze the table of changes so that it can read the data. Contemporary storage systems also have trouble holding all of that data. But big data can reveal some patterns, relationships, and anomalies in data sets that we may not necessarily see with traditional queries, select star from whatever table. Because we're only viewing a few tables at a time, traditional ways of querying data may not reveal patterns of use or things going, anything else going on in the data. So we go to some new tools to help us get to that. We'll talk about some of those tools in just a moment. What in the world do we do with all of our data from either big data sources or from our relational databases for running our business every day? Most common, we store them in a data warehouse. Um, so all of our databases have their own data store, their own data set where we use our data every single day. But we'll also put all of that data in something called a data warehouse. And inside of this data warehouse, we may do our data mining on it. We may do some reporting off of it. We may run some analytics against it as well. So this is going to store everything from today, as well as all of our historical data um, from all of our transactions. It's going to pull in data from all across the enterprise. So not just our sales data, it's going to have our HR data, it's going to have our accounting and manufacturing data in it, our sales data, everything in an all in one place. And we're going to use some different analytical tools against it because it's typically also a larger data set. Uh, we have to look at it a little bit differently. Sometimes it might be a big data set. Sometimes we might start looking at big data tools for it. Um, otherwise, we may just use contemporary tools uh, against it. We can still use SQL. Uh, we may start looking at Microsoft Power BI. Um, we might look at um, things like uh, Tableau to help, us, to help us take a look at those data sets. We can also break down those giant data warehouses into smaller subsets of data called a data mart. 
So say the accounting team wants some data related to just them, and they're not interested in all the rest of the data from everywhere else. They may want a smaller carve out, and we call that a data mart. And that's typically just on a line of business. Um, we may have a smaller one for um, HR. We might have a smaller one for uh, any other type of business unit. We'll take data out of the data warehouse, carve it out for just that particular um, entity that, that is looking for it. So what are some of the tools that we might use? A really popular one is Hadoop. Hadoop allows us to handle these big data sets by spanning the workload across multiple computers. And it does it by breaking up the load into something it calls the, distrib the Hadoop distributed file system. It breaks the load up, passes it out to the different computers. They all run their processing in parallel at the same time, and then they push it all back together. It also uses a, a technique called MapReduce, which was pioneered, I believe, by Google, which will take those data sets and put them into clusters to be worked on, and then brings them all together back together. That brings them all back together at the end. And then there's also HBase, which is NoSQL database. Rule this all up into Hadoop. And this is one of the more powerful big data mining solutions that is used today. I have here, it's used often by Google or Yahoo, but it's certainly used by Google as well. They even have their own and Amazon has come out with their own big data set, a uh, big data solution as well. Hadoop is an extremely popular tool. There are companies looking for uh, BI developers, business intelligence developers with Hadoop experience. So if you're thinking about going into the BI world, Hadoop is a great tool to learn. Some other tools that we have, and while this doesn't typically work for our big data sets because they're just too large, is something called in-memory computing. Um, and the book will say it's used in big data analysis, and it's a little hard to do that because sometimes of the size of some of these warehouses. Um, but this is where we take all of this, the data store, instead of trying to run it off of the server storage, whatever it may be, we load it into the, the server's RAM. We load it into its temporary storage, which is much, much faster than our um, computing storage could ever hope to be. And we do everything out of there. We can typically reduce the time to deliver those reports or whatever that uh, those queries are from hours and maybe perhaps days just down to seconds or minutes you really have to probably have spent a boatload of money on hardware to do it though. Particularly, you need a lot of RAM hamsters to get this done. Hamsters is the technical term for RAM. The servers need a lot of hamsters to get it done. It's not really the technical term, I just call them hamsters. The analytic platforms, these are high-speed platform, uh, platforms, both relation, relational and non-relational for the large data sets. Um, we're seeing this more happen in cloud computing because we can quickly, I'll say rent, um, the data store needs that we, ha that we have for those processing workloads for the time that we need them. And then we release them when we no longer need them. It's not 24 seven that companies will need this analytical power typically. So right now, the, the modern or contemporary way to handle these um, larger, larger needs is to use something like Azure, Google Cloud, uh, AWS, and process the analytics there, and then release those, uh, those servers back to, uh, back to wherever they came from um, when, you're, when you're done with whatever you needed.
just a quick example of how uh, of Hadoop. Um, Hadoop can handle most data set types. Um, and of course you can do uh, operational historical, kind of the same thing. They can handle web data, traffic, web, web traffic data, XML, anything you have in there, unstructured data, audio, video, audio, video, and data from any external data source that you could possibly come up with from uh, IOT devices, from our, our phones, our watches, wherever you can come up with it. There's a term here called extract, transform, and load. This is typically just brought down to an acronym called ETL. ETL is the process of taking the data from wherever it comes from, whatever form it comes from, and putting it into whatever form you need it to be in. So if you need it to go into, uh, you need it to come out of Excel and bring it into SQL, you'll run it through an ETL process. If you need to bring it out to whatever and bring it into your data warehouse, you'll go through an ETL process. Uh, you'll extract the data from its current form, maybe an Excel spreadsheet. You'll transform it through whatever kind of queries or manipulation you need to do. And you'll often have to do some data cleanup steps as well in that process. And then you'll load it into its final destination. That's called ETL, extract, transform, and load. From that data warehouse, you might carve it out to a data mart. You might move it up to an analytic platform for whatever it may be, queries, reporting, online analytical processing, OLAP, or data mining. Um, from your data warehouse or your mart, it might just go to queries, reports, or dashboards from Tableau or Power BI, something like that. Everyone okay so far? All right. Is our database is at least somewhat interesting to some folks? No one's asleep. I don't see the colors flickering on too many people's faces yet, which usually tells me you're on Amazon or playing a game or doing something else. That's usually how I can tell your face, your colors flicker on your face, so you're doing something else. All right. So the analytical tools, the relationships, patterns, and trends, I just mentioned OLAP, which is online analytical processing. Um, we'll first talk quickly about multi-dimensional data analysis or OLAP, but there's also data mining, text mining, and web mining. So OLAP, online analytical processing. This is for multi-dimensional data analysis. And this is, I'll explain what multi-dimensional is in just, a, uh, just the next slide here, but this is the ability to view our data from all sides and transaction data, I'm sorry, um, kind of cross sect that data looking at a few different ways. We might be able to look at different dimensions of our data, product, pricing, religion, religion, region and time, but intersect two of them at a time. We might look at product and cost. We might look at pricing and time period or product and time period or region and pricing and look at two of those dimensions at a time. And this is around something called cube data. Um, very big if you use IBM's Cognos, IBM's Cognos loads everything into data cubes, but each of these items, product, pricing, cost, region, and time period is a dimension. It's a dimension of our data. We're gonna look at our data through a product dimension or lens or pricing dimension or lens or cost dimension or lens. So we, a question we might be asked is how many washers were sold in the Eastern region in June compared with other regions? So we'll look at our product washers, we'll look at our region East and we'll look at a time period June. And we can do that through multi-dimensional analysis, looking at each of those items in a cube. Online analytical processing allows us or OLAP to do this with an ad hoc query, which just means kind of off the cuff, we can just build it and let it run um, very quickly. So here's just a, a graphical representation of something that can be often called a data cube or a multi-dimensional data model. You know, we can see nuts, bolts, washers, and screws, actual projected, and then the regions as well. And we can kind of slice and dice this however we might want um, and get that data. It's the queries are run, the model is loaded with data, and then we can look at it in whichever way is possible. Um, it's run typically one time the model is loaded and then we can keep looking at it. Um, you don't keep refreshing it every time you want to do it. It pulls it all in at once. 
you look at it, think of looking at a Rubik's cube and just keep spinning it around however many ways you need it. Um, and then it's released. You don't keep reloading it every single time you want to um, do that because the key thing about an online analytical processing is this is real time data. So if I loaded this uh, model up with data by refreshing it, and then I wanted to an hour later do it again, it could be possible, depending on the, the time of the year or um, the time frame that you look at, that you could show different data because um, you were looking at real time data. The opposite of online analytical processing is, um, I'm, I said that backwards, I apologize. Online analytical processing is um, the historical data. It has loaded, it will not change. I apologize. Uh, online analytical processing is loaded into our data warehouse and you can run it all day and it will not change. The opposite of that is our online transaction processing, which is up to the second real time information. And you can run a query and it will give you numbers and run it again a second later and it can give you different numbers depending on the time frames that you look at. So the beauty of looking at a data model like this in OLAP is that you can run it all the time and it will never change. If you ran this exact same model in an OLTP environment, online transaction processing, it could change every second. So you typically don't run data extractions uh, or data models like this in your transaction environment or your production environment because it just keeps changing and you'd never be able to do the queries and the analysis that you're looking for. So you want it done in an OLAP an analytical environment. So we move into data mining. And we are in the home stretch here. So we move into data mining. And in data mining, this is the ability to find those hidden patterns or relationships in our large data sets that we would not necessarily be able to see if we used more traditional tools like, uh, like SQL or maybe even Access for that matter because typically with Access or SQL, we're looking at joining just a few tables together. Um, and in those few tables, we might be looking at just a couple of columns um, inside of our query. And it's really hard in that instance to identify any patterns or trends. When we go to data mining, we kind of let the tool comb through the data for us and display patterns or trends that it may find. Um, it may take a look at associations we didn't think about. Um, it may look at patterns or trends we didn't think about. Um, it can look at clustering of data that we didn't see because um, we weren't looking for it or it's looking at a much larger data set. So there are some data mining applications and certainly the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning is augmenting this space that are able to identify trends, patterns, associations, and things that we cannot see because it's just um, too big of a data set for us to, to take in and to understand and, and to connect dots that we didn't see or didn't even know that were possibly there. Moving into text mining, this is extracting key elements from large unstructured data sets. And we can also talk about sentiment analysis. Where text mining uh, and particularly sentiment analysis really shine is through our social media. So when you are out there and you are um, taking your selfie with your friends and you did a hashtag with your white claw and there ain't no laws when you're drinking the claws and you did all those hashtags and you're smiling cause you did it, right? I see some smiles out there because you've done it. That is a gold mine for text mining because there are patterns in this and it's a large unstructured data set because it's Twitter or it's Instagram or it's Facebook. And then we use something called sentiment analysis. And inside of sentiment analysis, we can use some machine learning and it's actually available in, as a tool add-in for Microsoft Excel where it will look at uh, single words or phrases that, that are part of a, a, a text string and compare them to um, a dictionary, a, a compendium of known words that are listed as positive, negative, or neutral. 
And then from those words or phrases, determine if that entire phrase is generally positive, negative, or neutral. Brands use this like crazy against our social media posts to let us know if their product is trending positive or negative, or maybe it's just staying neutral. And again, when you're not paying for a product, you're the product being paid for. So when you do those free posts on Instagram and Twitter, companies like the alcohol beverage companies to every product that we use in our homes are paying those company boatloads of money for their data. And they're running your, your posts, your, your tweets, your Instagram captions, your Facebook messages, uh, all through sentiment analysis applications. And they're pulling back from that whether their product is doing better or worse um, and helping them with their marketing activities and their marketing decisions. Make sense? So maybe there should be some laws when you're drinking the clause. It's one of my favorites. I've taught a data and analytics course and we do mine uh, Instagram. And my favorite is I use Tito's and I use White Claw and it's my favorite. The captions in White Claw, they're amazing. The next one down is web mining. And this is discovering and analyzing useful patterns and information from the web. And this could be mining the, the actual content on a website, uh, how websites are laid out, or using information from products like Google Analytics to determine how people navigate the website um, how people land on certain websites, search engine and uh, optimization, search engine analytics, things like that to figure out how users navigate pages, um, how they navigate stores, what they buy, they don't buy, um, and how, how in general they just use the internet. And that's, that's web mining. If you're ever curious about Google Analytics, lots of fun videos on that program. It's really very fascinating. Um, uh, what what they what they track on just about every website that you visit, there's some Google Analytics happening on it. So with this next piece here, um, databases hosted on the web, most companies have some databases that are available uh, internally and externally. It's um, nothing new, nothing spectacular here. Um, just about everything that you do is logging into some database at some point. Even when we're logging into our, uh, we're logging into Canvas, we're logging into any of the applications, my mypit.edu. Um, there's a web server that we hit. Um, we're logging in through whatever authentication scripts we might have, and then it's hitting a database in the background to determine that we are who we say we are, or we have the credentials that we say who that we have and granting us access to what we should be accessing. So, you know, every time we log into this, to the pit site for anything, um, we're, we're basically hitting a, a web server with a database on the back end, absolutely every single time. Some advantages, uh, it's easy to use from a browser. We're certainly doing it. The web interface requires no changes to the database. Um, we can add things to the web interface without changing the database and vice versa. We can augment uh, the database without having to rebuild the web interface every single time. And it can be relatively inexpensive to add on different web interfaces or layers uh, to the system. And that's certainly what happens over time. One of the last pieces here, I think we're down to just the last couple of slides, is around any part of information systems, certainly with databases, there have to be rules, there have to be policies on how we're going to use it, how we're going to share information, manage users, manage the data, and certainly standardization of how we're gonna keep data. Garbage in, garbage out. Our databases are only good as the data that we're uh, storing in it, how good we're, we're doing that stewardship of the data. The database administration has policies and procedures to manage the data. There's typically an employee called the DBA, the database administrator, who is often charged with uh, keeping the database running, maintenance, um, and just in general, good operating order. We've talked before about data governance, and this deals with the policies and processes for managing the database itself, its availability, its usability, the integrity of the data, security of it, and um, any, any um, government regulations that might impact it. 
And of course, creating and maintaining databases. Uh, when you're creating new databases, the rules around it, who has access to it, if you have to decommission one, how that happens, um, and the maintenance that happens on them, you know, re-indexing jobs um, to make sure that it's performing optimally, and the other things that you have to do just to make sure that it's working, because very quickly a database starts filling up with data and performance will suffer to the point where users don't want to use it anymore and it becomes a bit of a problem and it's harder to um, harder to upkeep and, and keep going forward. So in the last slide here, uh, more than 25% of the critical data in the Fortune 1000 company databases is inaccurate or incomplete. Everybody is dealing with a bit of garbage. Before a new database is in place, companies should identify and correct the faulty data. And this happens a lot through that process I, I said, ETL, extract, transform, and load. When you're doing the transform process, do your part and do the data cleanup and establish better routines for the edit, editing the data once it's in the database. Uh, data quality audits, when you see things that are wrong, when you identify reports or data that's incorrect or inconsistent and accurate in the database, fix it. And of course that data cleansing as well. Um, remove bad data, remove the dirty data, it's not helping you, uh, or establish policies that can help you go back through the data with some periodicity and clean it up however it needs to be cleaned up. With that, I'll ask you if you guys have any questions. And I'm gonna stop my recording. <laughs>